we have a rotating frame, and we talked about how the basis vectors, um, the, the velocities of the basis vectors, and I would like to describe that in the general framework that we developed yesterday. So I would like to understand the fictitious acceleration that the rotating observer sees. Now, when you remember this um, general coordinate transformation, it, had, it was characterized by a number of um, variables, parameters. One was this shift, uh, D, that describes, oh, sorry, um, that describes the, the shift of the origin of the, co of the reference frame. Now, the, the, the rotating reference frame, the red one, has the same origin as my blue reference frame. So the displacement vector d is actually equal to zero. And this, this simplifies things. And secondly, I want to assume that the angular velocity with which the red frame rotates around my blue frame, that that is constant in time. So I want to assume that omega is constant in time. Now let's look, go back and have a look at this general formula here. All right, and this formula said that the fictitious acceleration that the rotating observer sees is given by these three terms. That's our starting point. Let's look one by one at these three terms. First of all, we said the displacement vector d is zero, and therefore its derivative, and obviously also the second derivative, is zero. So this does not contribute. Secondly, we know that the time derivative of the rotating basis vector is given by angular velocity cross EI prime. Now the second time derivative of the basis vector, that's we obtain that by taking the derivative of omega cross E prime once more. Now we said omega is constant in time, so there's no omega dot. So we get, this is omega cross E dot, E prime dot. But E prime dot, so we have, this is, this is omega cross E I prime dot. And for this, in turn, we can again use that E prime dot is omega cross E prime. So we have this is omega cross omega cross E I prime. Here we have the sum over I X I prime dot E I prime. What is this? what I encircled in green. This is the velocity seen by the rotating observer. Because it's the time derivative of the um, spatial components in the rotating frame. So it's the xi prime dot. Um, and the, the, the corresponding basis is E i prime. So this is V prime. <coughs> so taken together, what do we have for the fictitious acceleration? The fictitious acceleration is minus 2 omega cross V prime 
this is the first of these two terms minus um, <coughs> and here I should encircle something else in green now this one together with this what is this? I think you know it Right, it's the position in which frame? In the prime frame, exactly, that's x prime, right? So we have, for the second term, we have minus omega cross omega cross x prime. And I just realized one thing, just, just a matter of aesthetics. Um, since this fictitious acceleration is seen by the rotating observer, I would like to give the fictitious acceleration a prime. So we have the fictitious acceleration seen by the rotating observer has two contributions. One is omega cross velocity, and the other one is omega cross omega cross position. Do you recognize the physical meaning of these two terms? So maybe the second term is easier, yeah? Exactly, the second term is the centrifugal acceleration. We're not talking about forces yet, but of course you are right, that corresponds to the centrifugal force. And the first one? Exactly, very good. That's the Coriolis acceleration. So you see this general framework that we developed that uh, perhaps looked a little bit tedious yesterday, but when you apply it to specific situations, it gives you a very powerful framework to derive all these fictitious forces. Then let's move on and let's consider the laboratory frame that we use here on Earth. Do you think that, do you, do you expect to observe fictitious accelerations or later fictitious forces here on Earth. If I, if I perform an experiment here in this room, in this lecture, would you expect to see fictitious acceleration? Yes. So which kind? Coriolis acceleration. Coriolis? Right. Very good. That's, of course, a very important one. You all know the famous Foucault pendulum. Um, and there's another one which I'm going to show you in a, in a second. So here we talk about uh, laboratory. Laboratory frames. So let me try to sketch the Earth. So this is um, Earth. Here is the North Pole and here is the South Pole. And the Earth is rotating around the North-South axis. So we have here the North-South axis. And around this axis the Earth is rotating with some angular velocity omega. What is the angular velocity? It's 2 pi per day. Then we have our, we have our laboratory. Let's say we are we're in the northern hemisphere. We are somewhere here. So here we have a building, okay, a door, uh, 
and this is our lab. And in this lab, we observe, for example, a mass that is falling. Okay? So here we have, for example, a test mass falling in the lab. Okay. Now, in our lab, we have a frame which is sort of fixed with respect to the building. So we have, say we have here E1, E2, and E3. And this is the primed, this is the primed reference frame. Because we already know, we already uh, expect there to be fictitious acceleration. So this is not, this is not um, a fixed frame in space, meaning in the universe, but it's, uh, it's a moving frame. For the fixed frame, we can, we can choose a frame at the center of the Earth. E1, E2, E3. So this is fixed. Okay. And this one is moving. How are the two related? First of all, the origins are displaced. So we have a distance vector, d, pointing from the center of the Earth to the origin of our lab frame. This changes with time, so this is time dependent. And secondly, the Earth is rotating. And so are the basis vectors. So the EI primes are also rotating with respect to the fixed frame at the origin, at the center of the Earth. We do not consider uh, uh, different clocks, so we have the same, so we have the same time uh, T prime is equal to T, so we don't change the times just in space. Now let's consider the dynamics of this red test mass. Let's say it's freely falling towards the center of the Earth. So we have the dynamics of, um, the, of our test mass. First of all, in the um, fixed frame, we call it F, the acceleration of the test mass is simply given by the gravitational acceleration. What about the lab frame in our lab frame F prime? We have A prime is equal to A plus the fictitious acceleration. So it's G plus A prime fictitious. Now let's look more closely at the fictitious acceleration. When you look at our general formula, then remember that there were three contributions. There's minus the acceleration of the distance vector. Then there is the Coriolis force, which is two times omega cross V prime. And then there is the <coughs> centrifugal acceleration, which is minus omega cross omega cross x prime.
apply. So, in, pr and in principle, we have in principle we have all three effects in our lab frame. However, only two of them are significant. The last one. This one here, the centrifugal acceleration, this is obviously, this is of the order omega squared. Yeah. Now omega, as I said, is 2 pi per day, and this is, and therefore this is small. Yeah. Omega is pretty small. Now you see the Coriolis force is of the order omega, but the centrifugal, um, I'm already talking about forces, the, the, the Coriolis acceleration is of the order omega, the centrifugal acceleration is of the order omega squared. Now since omega is small, the Coriolis acceleration is much stronger than the um, centrifugal acceleration, and therefore the centrifugal contribution is negligible. Yeah? So this is, this is of the order omega, and the other is of the omega squared, and therefore this is negligible. So what remains are the, the Coriolis acceleration that you already mentioned, and also this um, D double dot. That's something that you should not neglect. Now, what does that? Uh, let's look one by one at these two at these two contributions. Let's first look at this D double dot. And this gives rise to an effective gravitational field. So we have the Earth. <coughs> Sorry. north and south, and we have our F here, and we have our um, F primed here, so this is for frame, okay. Now, the, for our test mass, we have um, here the gravitational acceleration. But then we get this fictitious force. Which, where does it point? In which direction? What's the acceleration of the distance vector? Which direction does it point? about it. So here we have our omega. The lab performs the following motion. The, the lab mm, I try to indicate it like this. This is how the this is how the lab moves. It moves around the rotation axis around the north-south axis. So the acceleration is pointing, D double dot is pointing towards the, towards the rotation axis. And minus the acceleration, so minus D double dot, therefore, is pointing away from the rotation axis. So we have here minus D double dot is pointing away from the rotation axis. So in the lab frame, actually, we see a gravitational acceleration where we take the minus d double dot into account. We see an effective gravitational acceleration, which is the sum of these two. G effective, which is G 
minus d double dot. And this effective gravitational acceleration no longer points towards the center of the Earth. No longer points to center of the Earth. And it's position dependent. So when we are at the North Pole, at the North Pole, there's d double dot is zero, and therefore the effective gravitational acceleration equals the regular gravitational acceleration, and therefore it does point to the center of the Earth. But um, likewise, when, um, when we are on the equator, then the e effective uh, gravitational acceleration is weaker than the regular gravitational acceleration, but it still points towards the center of the Earth. But when we are sort of in between, uh, like here in, uh, in Ulm, the effective gravitational acceleration no longer points to the center of the Earth. It's slightly tilted against that. Now, this is the reason why I drew the Earth now no longer as a sphere, and I exaggerated a bit, but the Earth is actually more like a, it's a bit flattened, yeah? So it's not, the Earth is not a perfect sphere. And it has a shape such that the effective gravitational acceleration is perpendicular to the surface, okay? So it's perpendicular to, to the surface of the Earth. And this is the reason why the Earth is not a perfect sphere. So we talked about this effective gravitational acceleration and its consequences, namely the Earth is not a perfect sphere. Now let's look at the Coriolis acceleration. And its consequences for the Earth. Now remember the expression for the Coriolis acceleration. So A Coriolis. This is minus two times omega cross V primed. Now what effect does that have? Let me draw again the Earth. Now it's almost a sphere again. And the rotation axis. Angular velocity omega. Now what happens if we, if we have a body? This is a sort of a test body on the northern hemisphere. Now let's assume that the, this test body moves with some velocity V prime towards the north. And then this test body experiences a fictitious acceleration, namely the Coriolis acceleration, and in which direction does it point? It points to the east. Huh?
if, uh, in contrast, the test body moves to the south, then the Coriolis acceleration points to the west. Okay. This is the reason why, and this is indeed true, if you, have, if you look at railway tracks on a north-south line, then you, you see that actually there's an asymmetry in how the tracks are used. It also um, has a very important effect on the weather when you have a high pressure zone and I'm sure you know these pictures you have in on the northern hemisphere you have a high pressure zone um, and then you have the winds and then the winds around this high pressure zone they go in this direction and if you have a low pressure zone that's what we often have coming from the Atlantic. We have a low pressure zone, then it goes the other way around. So then the wind goes in the opposite direction. Yeah? So the, the reason why on these satellite images of the weather you see these typical structures for high and low pressure zones, that's the Coriolis acceleration. Now I'd like to move on and consider a special class of transformations. And these are called Galileo transformations. A Galileo transformation is a, a, a change of reference frame that does not give rise to fictitious acceleration. In particular, this implies that if in my original frame I have no acceleration which means I have uniform motion then under a Galileo transformation in the new frame I also have no acceleration and hence a uniform motion and now this is another way of introducing Galileo transformations that you say under Galileo transformation uniform motion in one frame is mapped to uniform motion in the other frame. What does this imply? So this implies that the fictitious acceleration and now let's remember what that looked like let me copy this here So this fictitious acceleration for a Galileo transformation, this must be equal to zero. And this must hold for any, not just for a special trajectory, but it must hold for any trajectory. So it must hold for arbitrary, for arbitrary um, x. I primed and also x i prime dot um, this can only hold if this here is zero 
if this is zero and if that is zero. The first implies that the distance vector d may only perform a uniform motion. So it may be the most general form that is allowed is some velocity times t plus some time independent vector s. This is the most general form that is allowed. And the fact that the basis vectors are not allowed to change in time. We said the, the primed basis vectors are some rotation applied to the original basis vectors. And we allowed, at the beginning, we allowed this rotation to be time dependent. But if we say E prime dot must vanish, this means that the rotation may not be time dependent. Uh, so in fact, um, E i prime must be R applied to E i where R dot is zero. So this is a time independent rotation. So, so this restricts our transformations to the allowed transformations to sort of uniform motion of the origin of the new coordinate system and time independent rotations. And then we still have for the time we still allow that t primed may be t minus s. So this doesn't change. How many parameters determine a Galileo transformation? So what, what, are, what determines the Galileo transformation? We have the the constant shift of the origin S. Then we have possibly um, we have a shift in time. Then we have a relative velocity of one reference frame with respect to the other. And then we have a time dependent, time independent rotation. So how many parameters do we have here? It's a vector with three components. Now this is a clock shift. This is one parameter. This is the uh, relative um, motion of the origin. Now this velocity has three components. And this is a ti the time independent rotation. Now, how many parameters characterize a rotation? One way of seeing it simply is you, you have to specify the rotation axis. So to specify a rotation axis, you need two parameters. You specify a direction. That's, it's a vector, but only the direction matters. And then you have to specify by which angle you rotate around this axis, which gives you the third parameter. Yeah. So this is three. So in total, we have 10 parameters. Yeah. And um, sometimes one writes a Galileo transformation as a function of as a function of S, S, V0, and R, okay? So well, that's a Galileo transformation. Now, um, 
there's a when you have a transformation that transforms maps uniform motion to uniform motion and then you apply another Galileo transformation that again maps uniform motion to uniform motion. So you do two, two Galileo transformations in a row. In if you get an effective transformation, the combination of the two is again a transformation which maps uniform motion to uniform motion. So mathematically, what does that suggest? That Galileo transformations form a group. Okay. Galileo transformations form a group. And this is the so-called Galileo group. Okay? And <coughs> I expect that on your first problem set, which you will get over the weekend, um, there will also be one there will be exercises about the Galileo transformation and there will also be an exercise where you are asked to prove that the Galileo transformations form a group. Now, this is, uh, this is just a notation, a terminology. People talk, about, uh, people talk about a special Galileo transformation. Now, a special Galileo transformation is just a special case. Um, Namely, when I have no rotation at all, so the rotation operation is, is simply the unit uh, matrix. Uh, when I also have no constant um, displacement and I have no time shift, the only thing I have is, uh, is a relative motion of the two reference frames then this is called a special Galileo transformation. There's one remark I wanted to make. Another remark is the transformation of components. I think this is an, an important clarification and you will also work with this in, on your problem set We learned that under a Galileo transformation, there's no fictitious acceleration. So the acceler accelerations are the same in both frames. This applies to the vectors. Acceleration vector. But of course, in both, but when you look at components, at, at the components of these vectors, of course you will uh, have, you will represent these vectors in different uh, frames. So in the um, original frame, you will write the acceleration vector in this way. You have, it has components AI and you use the basis EI. Uh, in, in the um, transformed frame, you have different basis vectors, EI prime, and then of course with respect to this transformed basis, you will have different components, AI prime. So it's uh, important to note that while the vectors are the same, the components in the two frames are not. Yeah.
Okay, so this is uh, this is important uh, to to note, and um, similar considerations apply um, also to position vector and velocity vector. Um, they are not the same anyway, uh, not even as vectors, but then there is an additional difference in the components because again you will uh, represent them in different uh, bases. Yeah? So similarly for position and velocities and velocity they are not even the same as vectors. But there too you have to be careful in which when you look at whether you look at the vectors or whether you look at the components of these vectors. Uh, let me write this again. We say A prime is equal to A under Galileo. Yeah. We just said this is sum of i a i e a i prime e i prime, and this is sum of i a i e i. Now we know that under a Galileo transformation, uh, we know that e i prime is a rotation applied to e i. What does this mean for the components? It means AI prime. How do we obtain AI prime? It's the scalar product of, let me write it in this way, it's the scalar product of EI prime with A prime. Now, um, EI prime, this is R EI, scalar product with A prime, but A prime is equal to A. Now, A in turn is sum over I, AI, EI. So we can write this as. Um, sum over k, a k, then we have r e i, scalar product with e k. Or in other words, uh, if we reshuffle this a little bit, that's sum over k. Now the scalar product of r e with e i with e k, is the same as the scalar product of EI with R transpose applied to EK. Okay. And then we have AK. Now this is um, the IK component of the transpose matrix. Up to this point, we've only done what, what is also called kinematics. So the description of the motion of bodies without any um, explanation in the sense that we have a, a, a law of force that's behind this motion. Yeah? Um, now we would like to move in that direction. And we want to move towards the, really the foundations of Newtonian mechanics. And one, I mean, there's it's like the original way how Newton formulated his axioms. But of course, this has evolved over time. And there are now more modern ways of formulating the postulates of classical mechanics. And one of these postulates um, 
goes sort of in parts of the literature it goes by the principle of determinacy and it means the following it means the following that the in my reference frame so in the original reference frame the a com any component a component of acceleration is some function, some well-defined function, of the position of my body, um, the velocity of my body, and possibly may also vary with time explicitly. Um, but what's crucial here, it does not depend on higher order derivatives. It does not depend on um, aj or aj dot or aj double dot and so on. And you could env envision that uh, the acceleration of my body at a given time uh, depends, I don't know, on higher order terms, but it does not. So the principle of determinacy says that if I know of a body, um, it's, we're talking here still about a single body, not multi, many bodies that comes later. If I have a single body, um, then the acceleration of that body at a given time is determined by its position and its velocity and possibly the time itself at that given time. 